So, um, I'm Mark Alexander. I am the Dean here at the Villanova University Charles Widger School of Law, and I am pleased to be able to introduce you uh, to our day uh, for an extraordinary day I expect ahead about the, uh, the Ryan Forum, which is um, a great tradition we have here and I think uh, reflects the greatness of uh, Matthew J. Ryan himself. So I just want to tell you about, um, about Speaker Ryan for a moment and tell you uh, a little bit about what we're going to be doing today and then turn it over uh, to our, our panelists. Uh, the forum itself actually was created about almost 10 years ago. Come, you can come on in here. You want to you mic me up? Or are you going to mic up somebody there and say, I'm, I'll just speak loud. OK. So that's the empty chair. Um, sorry. Uh, so the, the forum was, was uh, founded, uh, created about 10 years ago uh, with uh, leadership of a number of our alums, um, including actually I see Jim, where did I see you? Jim McElhane. There you are again. Uh, thank you very much. Jim McElhane has been a great supporter. A number of alums have been very supportive. Uh, and um, he has been supportive throughout in founding it, and, and this year is no exception. So I'm very glad that he's here today. We actually had a chance to get together and chat uh, about our own, I think, both of our uh, commitment to uh, good uh, public policy, good government. Um, and, and I think this is just another example of how we can um, help hopefully shape uh, better results for, for all of us going forward. Uh, Speaker Ryan was uh, a graduate. Uh, undergraduate here and the law school as well, and uh, he was elected to the House of Representatives in 1962. Um, he was a 1959 graduate of the, of the law school. Uh, I mentioned that he was uh, elected in 1962 because uh, he served until 2003 when he passed, uh, making him the second longest serving member of the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. Uh, he was Speaker of the House uh, on two different occasions. I, I guess if you can uh, serve for 40 years, then you can be Speaker twice. But it's, it was uh, remarkable because he was seen as, as one of the great uh, statesmen out there. Um, and, and in fact, after his death, he was so well regarded that his uh, body lay in state in the Capitol Rotunda, being actually the first person um, in the current Capitol to have that, that honor. And he was widely regarded for um, both being strong in his views, but also being even stronger in his commitment to uh, statesmanship. And, and I hope that in this time that we are currently living in, that while we are sort of in this uh, silly season of politics, <laughs> that we can remember the utmost uh, commitment to, to statesmanship, to uh, civil conversation, uh, and a commitment ultimately to serving uh, the greater good. And so, um, we are, we're quite happy that we have the uh, Matthew J. Ryan Law and Public Policy Forum because to us it's a way in which we can see that Speaker Ryan is still serving uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and the entire country. And so with that background, um, today we're going to be talking about the opioid epidemic. And it is unfortunately uh, no longer surprising that there is an opioid uh, epidemic here in this country and specifically here in Pennsylvania. There was a report this past summer which highlighted a few statistics which I'll mention, which I'm sure will be mentioned and discussed as we go forward. Um, Pennsylvania um, ranked eighth in the country in uh, drug overdose deaths in, in 2014. In 2015, there were uh, 3,383 drug-related overdose deaths in Pennsylvania, which was uh, not just a large number, but an increase of 23% um, from the year before. Uh, the, the overdose death rate uh, went to 26 per 100,000 people, which is, again, an increase uh, from the year before. And what we know is that heroin in all this was the most frequently identified uh, drug in toxicology test results, and it's a pervasive um, drug of abuse. And so we are here in the middle of Pennsylvania and throughout um, the country, uh, we are seeing that uh, opioid abuse is, is an extraordinary health crisis, an extraordinary public policy crisis. And uh, today's Ryan Forum will explore this topic uh, from various perspectives. And I'm just so pleased that we are able to draw together here uh, folks across different disciplines uh, 
Uh, it's not just about talking about law. It's not just talking about medicine. It's not just talking about public policy. I'm talking about a wide range of approaches so that we can um, deal with um, various ways to address this critical um, issue. So uh, with that uh, brief introduction, uh, I will certainly turn it over to those who know far more than I do. Um, but uh, with my last words, I just want to say thank all of you for coming. Thank you to all those who are on our panels. Uh, thanks for all who have helped put it together. And I hope you have um, a great day discussing this important topic today. Thank you very much. Alexander. Um, my name is Michael Campbell, and I'll be moderating our first panel. Um, I teach health law here, and I direct the Interdisciplinary <coughs> Mental and Physical Health Law Clinic, where students practice law in the health law arena under my license. So it's a scary position. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to introduce our panel uh, in the order that they'll be speaking. Uh, and uh, they will each be going, giving you a brief presentation, and then we'll be opening things up for questions here on the topic of the scope of the opioid uh, epidemic. So, delighted to welcome uh, immediately to my left our first speaker, who is uh, Dr. Rachel Levine. Uh, she is currently the Physician General for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, uh, and Professor of Pediatrics and Psychiatry at the Penn State College of Medicine. Um, previous posts that Dr. Levine has held uh, were Vice Chair for the Clinical Affairs of the Department of Pediatrics and Chief of the Division of Adolescent Medicine and Eating Disorders uh, at the Penn State Hershey Children's Hospital, uh, Milton S. Hershey Medical Center. She is a graduate of Harvard College, uh, Tulane University School of Medicine, and she completed her uh, training in pediatrics at the Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City where she also did a fellowship in um, adolescent medicine. Um, <clears throat> our next speaker, all the way to the, uh, to the other end of the table, is Dr. Scott Shapiro. He is the president, current president of the Pennsylvania Medical Society, and he is a cardiovascular disease specialist and internal medicine specialist, uh, <coughs> local from uh, Lower uh, Gwinnett. <clears throat> He um, has, passed, has served as the past president of the Montgomery County Medical Society uh, and served as a fellow in the American College of Cardiology. Um, he's a graduate of Temple University School of Medicine uh, and currently practices, as I said, as a cardiologist at Abington Medical Specialist in Abington. He's also co-founder of on-call physician staffing with locations in hospitals and health systems throughout New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and the suburbs. Uh, and our final speaker, uh, centered here, is uh, Devin Reeves. Devin is a person living in recovery since 20, uh, in 2007. He's a tireless community organizer and grassroots advocacy leader. Uh, he's worked on expansion of access to the life-saving drug uh, naloxone and implantation of, uh, implementation of 911 Good Samaritan policies in the community. Uh, he works as a clinical outreach coordinator of Life of Purpose, uh, the only residential treatment center in the nation on a college campus. Um, he established and operates Brotherly Love House, a recovery residence in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He holds a master in social work from the University of Pennsylvania School of Social Policy and Practice uh, with a focus on community and organizational change and uh, a BA in human services from the university. So thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you very much for that introduction, and I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, so as the Dean had mentioned, uh, we are really facing the biggest uh, public health crisis um, uh, about this issue that we have ever known. Um, it is uh, really the largest public health issue that we have in Pennsylvania, um, as well as in the nation. And uh, the term epidemic, I think, is appropriate because um, it really is of epidemic proportions. And if, you, if this were an infectious disease, how we usually think of epidemics, um, we, uh, we would be feeling overwhelmed by it. And so uh, has reached out of proportions. Actually, uh, there has been an update in the statistics so that 3,505 uh, um, overdoses um, uh, occurred in Pennsylvania, overdose deaths in Pennsylvania in 2015. Uh, that's a 25 to 30% increase from 2014, which again was an increase of that proportion from 2013. 
and the statistics in 2016 uh, look to overtake that. Um, this is not just an issue in Pennsylvania, it's an issue um, in, throughout the country. Uh, this is a problem uh, in urban America, in Pennsylvania, it's a problem in the suburbs, and it's a significant problem in rural Pennsylvania. The rate of overdose deaths, uh, overdoses in Philadelphia County were 45.9 per 100,000, and in Cambria County, in rural Pennsylvania, it was 42.5 per 100,000. This is men and women, it really uh, spans all demographic groups and all areas. So I'd like to talk about how we got here in terms of this crisis, and it really is the perfect storm of different factors uh, that all came together, and it really started in the 90s, in the 2000s, and, and the first really um, trigger was uh, an emphasis by federal regulatory authorities, CMS, Joint Commission, and others, um, that uh, on assessing and treating pain is that uh, medical professionals, physicians, hospitals had to do a much uh, more robust job in assessing and treating acute and chronic pain. So uh, you had the smiley faces that physicians would use and you had um, pain became quote unquote the fifth vital sign, pulse, blood pressure, respiration, well the fifth was, was pain. Um, at the same time, there was the development of extremely powerful, um, long acting, and unfortunately very addictive opioid pain medications that were marketed uh, to medical uh, physicians and other medical providers that they actually would not be addictive for patients with pain. Um, that was based on a small number of small studies and proved to be completely false, that it is extremely addictive. But the use of opioid pain medications went up, the prescription rate went up 400% over the course of 10 to 15 years. Um, so that people were being prescribed long-acting medications with long prescriptions for acute pain and uh, for chronic pain. And for chronic pain outside of um, other traditional uses, which was cancer or end of life. But other types of chronic pain for long-term prescriptions. Uh, the third piece of the puzzle was the influx of cheap, powerful, and plentiful heroin from Central and South America and Asia. And you put those factors together and it has exploded into the crisis that we have today. I've said many times that I think it is not useful to us try to assign blame or to cast blame because then we just sit and yell at each other and blame each other. I think that there's certainly enough responsibility to go around. I think that uh, federal regulatory agencies bear responsibility. I think the medical community bears responsibility. I think that the pharmaceutical industry bears responsibility, and I think society bears responsibility, and so we need to all uh, accept that responsibility and now work together to overcome this crisis. Um, there are um, some new compounds which have, been, uh, which, which have been available now, which have led to even more overdoses. One of them is called fentanyl. Fentanyl, um, an artificial fentanyl that's being produced, um, has been used for post-op care, for cancer pain, end-of-life pain. It is 50 to 100 times more powerful than morphine and can lead to overdoses. And the newest compound that we've seen in Ohio and we're worried about in Pennsylvania is called carfentanyl. How many people have heard of carfentanyl? Well, carfentanyl is an anesthetic that was developed literally for elephants. It is an elephant anesthetic. It is 100 times more powerful than fentanyl which is 100 times more powerful than morphine. If you do the math, it's 10,000 times more powerful than morphine and can immediately lead to overdose and death. That's what we're facing from the drug dealers. So the, the Pennsylvania has been working with all of our stakeholders. We've been working with federal stakeholders, with, uh, with local stakeholders, with the community, Pennsylvania Medical Society, and other important stakeholders on this effort. Uh, it is an interdepartmental um, effort under the governor's leadership. This is a priority to Governor Wolf. I was on a cabinet meeting on the drive over here and emphasizing the governor's commitment uh, to us addressing this issue, and it's all hands on deck. So the first is a term that was actually first used at Penn State Hershey Medical Center, to give credit, but I've, uh, we've kind of expanded to some of the state's efforts, and that is called opioid stewardship. Usually, uh, we have been thinking of that in a medical term in terms of antibiotic stewardship, being, being using antibiotics more judiciously to uh, prevent resistance to antibiotics. But in this context, I like the term because I think we need to use opioids more judiciously in the medical community. 
and it means we're not getting rid of opioids. If you break your leg or you have an operation today, you need opioids. If you have cancer or you have someone in palliative care, you need opioids. But the pendulum has swung way too far. So we need better opioid stewardship. So in that light, uh, um, actually with PA Med, we have convened the deans of all the medical schools in the state, uh, allopathic and osteopathic medical schools, and uh, hopefully at the end of September, beginning of October, we will be producing a document with clinical competencies that any graduating medical student should have on this topic. We also, again with PA Med, have worked on providing um, medical and, uh, and other health professional continuing education. So there are four modules available now. One is coming shortly, um, and it's, it's uh, appropriate for physicians, but also nurses, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants, dentists, podiatrists, and pharmacists. And it counts towards our credit for license about all of these topics. Critically important in terms of, of, of continuing education. We also have produced evidence-based prescribing guidelines for <coughs> opioids. Uh, for, uh, for specific specialties, such as the emergency medicine physicians, um, OBGYN, geriatrics, etc. And those have been taken and affirmed and accepted by the appropriate um, medical board. So by the Board of Medicine, Board of uh, Dental Board, Pharmacy Board, Nursing Board, etc. The Prescription Drug Monitoring Program went live two weeks ago. That's a program where pharmacists will input any controlled substance that's being dispensed into this database, and physicians and other providers can check that database before they write a prescription to see if someone has gone to five different medical providers and two emergency departments looking for those drugs. And then they can refer that patient for treatment. Uh, you mentioned naloxone. We are expanding access of naloxone. I was very pleased last year to write two standing order prescriptions for naloxone. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, this was approved by attorneys, you know, the Department of Health, the government, we have an army of attorneys uh, that, that had to approve this. But as Physician General, I wrote a standing order for the first responders, such as the police, to have naloxone. Since that time, police in Pennsylvania have saved over 1,300 lives with the use of naloxone in the field by Pennsylvania State Police and municipal police. Um, we also wrote a standing order prescription that actually anyone in Pennsylvania can go to a pharmacy and obtain either the intranasal or the auto-injector naloxone based upon my prescription as physician general. You do not have to have a prescription by your own physician. You can go down the street to CVS, Rite Aid, Walgreens, or any private pharmacy and obtain naloxone based upon my prescription. And we're continuing to work on that implementation, and it has been very successful. The last two things, so one is a warm handoff to treatment. That's the term. Uh, so we want a facilitated referral to treatment, and we're working on guidelines for that. But we want a firm warm handoff. We don't want to say, you know, gee, maybe you should get treatment. You just overdose. We want this, you almost died. You, you really absolutely need to go for treatment, and this is where we're going to refer you. Uh, we're expanding treatment. Uh, there are going to be 45 centers of excellence uh, through Medicaid uh, throughout the state to expand treatment and medication-assisted treatment. And the last are take-back boxes. That if someone um, has medicine in their cabinet, if you leave it in your medicine cabinet, it gets diverted into the illegal system. And so we want people to take excess medicine and bring it to your uh, local municipal police stations and they have take-back boxes, which are actually picked up by the National Guard and incinerated. So this is, this is a quite a heavy lift, as, as, we, uh, as we often say. Um, this, we have to be patient. We have to be relentless and persistent, um, involving all our stakeholders, community, state, and federal stakeholders. And together, I think that we can bend the curve and we can overcome this crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Now, Dr. Shapiro.
All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate uh, being invited to speak with you today. Um, I'm in a private practice of 17 cardiologists up in Abington, and uh, the list of one-liners that they gave me to bring today, which I chose not to use of a doctor sitting in front of a group of lawyers, was, was rather long. But it's nice to be here in a very friendly environment, putting on my suit and not seeing my patients. Uh, to really address with you today the Pennsylvania Medical Society's efforts to address the opioid crisis we have in Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania Medical Society is a leader in promoting responsible prescribing practices for our, uh, for our physicians uh, and we're a key part of the solution to help our patients and our communities address the heroin opioid and opioid abuse crisis we're suffering here in Pennsylvania. Physicians across Pennsylvania have been working to help our communities better understand how the crisis developed over time. And we as, what we as physicians and community health leaders can do to help solve the addiction problem. Physicians aren't the problem, but rather, we're an important part of the solution. Who better than physicians to maintain and nurture relationships with our patients? Every day, I'm sitting with patients in my exam room, and I have the opportunity, when appropriate, when dealing with a patient who's having pain, to try to identify if they are someone who we feel is at risk for potential abuse and overdose. PA Med is always advocating on behalf of Pennsylvania's patients and physicians. These efforts include working with government agencies, staffing work groups, and task forces for testifying to provide expert insight and advice and opinions before our legislator. I'd like to take a few minutes to share with you some specific examples of what PA Med is doing to work on behalf of our members and our patients. PA Med, over the past several years, has convened an opioid task force and our members work together with the Department of Health to draft the prescribing guidelines that Dr. Levine earlier mentioned. PA Med served as the convener of input and feedback from many stakeholder groups important to addressing the opioid crisis. PA Med had one of its finest moments, in my opinion, this past summer when we held the Opioid Summit at the Capitol. And after that, we continued our momentum by providing an opioid symposium for physicians and other key stakeholders. On that day, legislators from all over the state received materials to take back to their constituents in all of our communities, addressing the basic questions to the more complex. Questions as simple as, what is an opioid? To many patients and to many people in communities, they don't even know what that is, to the much more complex as to how do we get to the addiction crisis that we have today. At the symposium, we modeled the techniques that was mentioned earlier by Dr. Levine of the warm handoff, which is the ideal method for assisting a person who's treated in an emergency room for an addiction or an overdose. We had a ready physician that really walked everyone through what it's like for us as physicians when we see a patient who either self-identifies, which is unfortunately not as common as we would like, or who presents as an overdose, potentially whose life may have just been saved with the drug saving naloxone, which fortunately now has been signed into law that most, if not all, of our first responders should be carrying. And when those patients show up, that's when they're at their time of greatest vulnerability. And that's the time when we don't let them leave our offices or our hospital if we want them to survive. And we have to get them that warm handoff or that transition directly from the office or the emergency room into an inpatient facility. These efforts were highlighted and the importance of these efforts ongoing were highlighted through those symposiums. Grassroots efforts across the Commonwealth. A survey was conducted by the Pennsylvania Medical Society of current medical students and residents. Residents being those physicians that have completed their training. They are physicians, I'm sorry, they've completed their schooling. They are physicians, but they are still in active training. And they were able to identify that the current lectures and training for these physicians and physicians in training on opioid prescribing isn't comprehensive enough to meet the needs of our communities. Because of that, PA Meds working closely, as was mentioned earlier, with the medical school deans and the residency program coordinators to come up with a comprehensive set of programs and guidelines which all of our medical students and residents will be participating in as part of their graduation requirements. PA Meds going to con will continue to work with stakeholders and collaborating organizations with law, force, uh, law enforcement, local school districts, state and local government officials, and the pro pro public and private stakeholder groups to provide education 
and to build awareness of the opioid crisis within our schools and within our communities. With our partners at the Pennsylvania Pharmacists Association, we're working to train healthcare professionals on addiction issues as we partner with law enforcement and the PA Department of Drug and Alcohol on drug take back programs for those drug drop off boxes, uh, as was mentioned earlier. On the education front, PA Med has been working with 11 organizations, including the Department of Health, the DDAP, and the state organizations representing the CRNPs, nurses, physician assistants, and pharmacists in, un in an unprecedented collaborative effort to develop education and other resources for prescribers and dispensers addressing opioids, addiction, and overdose. And through our collective efforts, we've developed multi-session online continuing education programs, which Dr. Levine also highlighted earlier today. This fall, the fifth course in the series will be available that will emphasize that pain should be managed through a multimodal approach while highlighting the mainstream common alternatives to opioid therapy to manage our patients with pain. The Pennsylvania Medical Society has a foundation, and the foundation has something called the Lifeguard Program which is there to assist physicians personally when they're in a time of need. <coughs> PA Med wants to make sure that all physicians are prescribing appropriately and that everyone prescribing knows what the current guidelines are. Because as we understand this epidemic, we realize that guidelines from 10 years ago, while best evidence-based medicine of the day, were inappropriate and not appropriate for today. The Lifeguard Program offers expertise to help doctors that have been identified as prescribing outside of the new current guidelines address and remedy these practices through attending programs like I have highlighted here on the screen, which is a two-hour, excuse me, a two-day intensive program around controlled substance and opioid prescribing. This program is unique. Using a combination of didactic learning, care-based uh, discussion, and the use of standardized patients the program will differentiate itself in that it looks at a provider's individual prescribing habits and practices. And for those who have had difficulties or identified as potentially having difficulties, it will monitor their practice for years to come after the two-day program is over so that we can assure the state boards that the change in knowledge has resulted in the appropriate change in prescribing behavior patterns. This is the program. Public Health Advocacy Program, Opioids for Pain, Be Smart, Be Safe, Be Sure. This is a program that the Pennsylvania Medical Society rolled out on our Opioid Symposium Day and continues to use across the state on a daily basis. The program has several simple goals. Reduce opioid abuse and overdose. Educate our patients about the safe use of opioids and the warning signs that we should be able to recognize in ourselves or others of addiction, and to help physicians prescribe opioid drugs with more precision and less potential for dangerous abuse. The key points of the program, be smart. Patients should know the risk of opioids when they receive a prescription. No one who gets that prescription for the first time ever plans on becoming an addict, but they, they frequently become addicts because they ignore dosing limits or they ignore the frequency with which their physicians tell them to take their medicine. Be safe. Patients should be instructed on how to use opioids for moderate to severe pain and warned not to save their extra pills or to give them to friends or relatives, however well intended they may think that seems. Physicians are encouraged to write smaller prescriptions with fewer or no refills. And the Pennsylvania Medical Society has a link on their website to find where you can go in your communities to safely drop off your excess pills that are potentials for addiction. And finally, be sure, patients should be told of the early signs of addiction, as I mentioned earlier, or abuse, and how to protect themselves from addiction, including how to avoid it in the first place and where to turn if they fear they may be currently addicted. PA Med's communication team and the Department of Health's Prescription Drug Monitoring Program have coordinated communication efforts to share informational resources and to get the word out to Pennsylvania physicians regarding registering for this very important database. 
the governor and his, his cabinet should be commended for the work they did to, to get this off the ground. It's a tool we've needed in Pennsylvania for a long time. PA Med has also developed a short CME course, Continuing Medical Education, designed to help providers outline a plan to review and incorporate the PDMP data into clinical decision-making processes through the use of practice, uh, through the use of practical clinical studies, which will help us identify red flags that may need to be addressed before we prescribe an opioid that physicians until now may not have considered. Physician challenges. Well, as I close, I just want to say that the physicians all across our area and really all across the country are not shy about sharing the challenges that we face in the opioid crisis. I think it's important, as Dr. Levine pointed out, to recognize that we all share a role in this. All the stakeholders in medicine do, and physicians understand what role we've played in the past and what role we need to play in the future. We've heard loud and clear from our members across the state that they're concerned that there may be unintended consequences to some of our efforts that we need to be paying attention to. When we, with the best of intentions, don't re-prescribe a narcotic for a patient, that through all these efforts we are finally able to identify as having a problem, we need to be able to make that warm handoff. It's important to recognize that patients and people who are addicted to opiates have a medical condition. That addiction is, can be looked at just like you would look at someone who has high blood pressure or cancer. It's a medical problem that needs treatment, and you can't just wish it away. And so when we identify those people, we know that there is a chance that by not writing their prescription, if they leave our offices, they will have to feed their disease somehow. They, it is difficult to kick heroin, and we, to kick opiates, and we fear that they'll turn to heroin. Pretty much every physician I talk to wishes we had more time to talk with our patients about the opioid use and addiction or to engage them in more in-depth in -depth conversations about how to manage the issue themselves with their family or with their communities, which is why we're trying to make this a multidisciplinary, multifactorial, community-based effort. Finding and referring a patients to the appropriate resources is something that we all find to be challenging. So we're making progress, but we still have more work to do. And PA Med is committed to working with the physician community as well as patients as we continue to do battle to reduce opioid use and abuse. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. And now, uh, Mr. Reese. Boy, that's a tough act to follow, huh? Uh, so, my name is Devin Reeves, and I'm a person in long-term recovery. And for me, that means that I haven't used any mood or mind-altering substances since August 21st, 2007. conference call, well, first when they asked me to come and speak here, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll go anywhere and talk about recovery and drug policy. For the few people in the room know me, I don't really ever stop talking about this. But when they told me who the panelists I was going to be next to were, I was kind of nervous. I said, how do you follow up these kind of great minds? And uh, I figured I would kind of like, you know, think about it. I had some notes, and then I said, let's see how it goes, and I'll see what they talk about and see where I can follow in. And, uh, so I'm a social worker by training, which is, in my mind, like the opposite of lawyers. You guys are taught how to think very analytically and you know, do all those things. So social workers, we're like the feelings, warm, fuzzy guy. So we're going to do a feeling, warm, fuzzy guy activity together real quick because I think research and statistics and the academic view of substance use disorder is very important. But I want to bring it into the room because that's what we're taught at social work school. So please be willing to participate just a little bit. So how many people know somebody with diabetes? Please put your hand up. Okay, so <laughs> diabetes exists in almost the exact proportion of substance use disorder in our community. Uh, there was a lot of hands raised. Um, let's try to bring it one step closer to home. And I'm really going on a limb here. I just thought about it while I was here. Um, please stand up if you know somebody who's had a problem with drugs. Everybody almost is standing up except four or five people. Um, please sit down. Um, please stand up if you are also in recovery. Let's give these people a hand. Please stand.
hand if you know somebody in recovery. Okay. Uh, sit down. Thank you. Uh, so we're not doing our job until everybody that stood up that said, I know somebody who has a substance use disorder also stands up and we say, I know somebody that's in recovery. It's really just as simple as that. Um, you know, if you guys remember one thing, it's, uh, it's that substance use disorder affects people. Um, and I think that's something that gets lost in um, the media and how it's like needles and dun 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 in the music. I mean, these are real people's lives. Um, and it's important the way we talk about this audience, you know, I am not an addict. Um, you wouldn't call somebody crazy today. I would be rude as a clinician to be like, that person's crazy. My peers would be like, you know, and when we run around calling people addicts, that's the equivalent. The diagnosis is substance use disorder. It's about person first language because we forget about people, right? Johnny isn't an addict. Johnny is a person struggling with a chronic brain disease and it affects him and it affects his family and it affects his community. Um, and so the scope of this looks like on a day-to-day -day basis is there is a mother of an 18 to 25 year old who walks into her uh, son's room, picks up his clothes, takes them to wash them, and is checking the pockets because men, we're not too bright, we never check our pockets before we throw stuff in the laundry, and she finds little wax fold paper bags. And she doesn't even know what they are. And then maybe she mentions it offhand to a friend. I found these little bags or waxy things, a little stamp on it. And her friend's like, you know, that's, that's heroin. I saw a special on NBC 10. And she doesn't even know what to do. There is no phone number to call in Pennsylvania if you know somebody that has a substance use disorder. Um, I am very well connected and educated uh, and networked in this agency, I mean in this state. And if someone calls me and says, you know, Devin, I have no insurance, I have a heroin problem and I want to stop, it is sometimes really often hard to find them help. Sometimes when somebody says, I have Medicaid, I have a substance use disorder, and I want to stop, it is sometimes really hard to find them help. So we have uh, a consumer base, people that don't know how to even get out of this problem. That is such a huge issue. And while I commend, like Dr. Levine is like my hero. Uh, when I heard, so we have seven states um, out of the 33 that allow for standing orders uh, to be done. I think Pennsylvania is the third and fourth. Um, so we still have a lot of work to go as a nation, but there is still so much more we have to do. And a lot of our solutions to me, not to put down anybody else in this crowd, feel like responses. Uh, and I think the prescription drug monitoring is good, but when we look at Kentucky, who several years ago enacted this, um, with, so, how do I want to say this? So we're going to cut people off of their opioids, and they're going to go use heroin, and they're going to die. It's not an unintended consequence, it's a fact. And I understand why we have to do it, but doing it without um, more access to treatment, and the governor did, he got $25 million for treatment, but he wanted like three times as much. And the state legislator said no. Um, and it's up to us as a community to be engaged in civic action around this. We need to call our legislators and say, you know, I know somebody who had a substance use disorder. I know somebody in recovery, and I care about this issue. And you need to vote that way, because they work for us. Um, and it's been too long, not just here in Pennsylvania, but really in Washington, D.C., that pharmaceutical companies and their lobbyists have plotted to destroy us so they can make profit. They knew opioids were addictive. They knew, just like Big Tobacco knew many, many years ago that 
cigarettes were no good for us. And they did it anyway. And there are several states and cities and municipalities across the country that are taking them to court. The city of Chicago is a great example. They are eventually going to get paid. And it's about time that they pony up and start paying for prevention services, for substance use disorder treatment, and the myriad of other services that we need. Um, one last thing I want to touch on before I wrap up and move face to the panel section is um, I look around this room and I count four other people of color. Uh, five. Thank you. My bad. And um, what I can tell you is as a person of color, it didn't really feel like you guys cared about this until it happened to Wayne. Until it came to the main line. Okay? Uh, my father was a, was a person with a uh, opioid use disorder. Right? He left us when we were two. You know, just destroying our family. But the laws around the crack epidemic of the 1980s ravaged North Philadelphia and ravaged urban centers all across this country. It was punitive, it was we're going to lock them up. If you use drugs, if you sell drugs, you're the enemy. And that was wrong. And there is no current solution to today's drug epidemic that doesn't include fixing that. Because the solution for, you know, Kensington and Somerset is different than the main line. It's different than Allegheny County. And it's definitely different than Cumberland County. And if we don't come up with social justice encompassing laws, we're not gonna fix this, or it's gonna be the white man's solution. And I, for one, don't wanna be part of that solution. And now there are people up <laughs> So I can tell you that there are a lot of awesome people doing great work around this. Local grassroots advocates, you know, I'm part of an organization called Young People in Recovery, and we're just a bunch of young professionals and students that say, we're tired of our friends dying and we're gonna do something about it. And we try to uh, engage politicians, we collect signatures, uh, we're really out in the community when there's a panel going on or an event, we wanna be out there, uh, and that's super important. I know great parents groups that are here today uh, be a part of the conversation and no task force that are in their community educating parents and doing the, you know, just doing what needs to be done. There's treatment centers, Karen Treatment Centers, Malvin Treatment Center, that are providing some of the best treatment in the nation to make sure people get what they need. But what I can tell you guys as lawyers is that, uh, I know not everybody in the audience is lawyers, is that um, one day you may be a policymaker. Remember, that I am a person with a substance use disorder and one day I may relapse. And if you throw me in a cage, my daughter will never know her father. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you very much. Bef um, two things. Uh, we, before we open it up to questions, um, I wonder if any of the panel members have comments, questions, observations about each other's uh, talk. And after we do that, I'll not only open it up for questions here, uh, but uh, we had, this was such a popular event that we had an overflow crowd, and uh, they promised to text me questions from over there, so I may interrupt. It's not that I'm, I'm checking my cell messages. It's, uh, so, yes. Yes, I, I have a couple. I, I would agree 100% uh, that Substance abuse disorder, opioid use disorder are illnesses. They are medical illnesses. They're not moral failings. And I think that we have to eliminate the stigma associated with these medical conditions and uh, view them the way we view diabetes or a heart attack. You know, uh, we've heard that some, uh, sometimes people don't want to use naloxone because they don't want to keep resuscitating someone. It's like, well, they wouldn't say that if it was an AED with a heart attack. They wouldn't right. say, you know, you've had two heart attacks before. I'm sorry. We won't, we won't resuscitate you now. Um, and so we have to eliminate the stigma. Um, I would agree, and, and we've worked with law enforcement, so I don't want you to think that we don't uh, work with law enforcement and public safety, uh, and we work with the, with the Pennsylvania State Police and the DEA and the FBI and HIDA, etc. But they all say 
that this that from their point of view, this is a public health problem, uh, and that you're not going to arrest your way out of this. It's 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 freshman economics. It, it, you cannot they cannot deal with the supply if the demand is so high, and that's why it's cheap. And you could literally go down the street and buy heroin for seven dollars, five dollars. Um, the third is, I don't know if, if Dr. Shapiro will mention it, but I think it's important to emphasize that the Pennsylvania Medical Society has put those continuing education modules on their website for free. So right now, at least through the end of the year, they are available for free to medical professionals uh, to, to take for our license. And I think it was a fantastic, a fantastic um, um, program for them to, uh, to really sponsor them, uh, pay for those modules, and to put them on their website for free. Thank you. Okay, I don't know if we have anybody running around with a microphone. If not, I'll repeat the questions. Uh, this. Okay, um, hello, thank you. Uh, I have a wonderful talk. Um, actually, two questions. The first one being trauma, being so immersed in addiction, and there being uh, the study done in uh, Philadelphia, the ACEs study uh, regarding uh, our youth. Uh, is, do you, are the pediatricians involved at any level with uh, these models? And so, if so, will SABRIT, which is a pre-screening and early prevention right. tool, be introduced at some level uh, to determine that there should be certain um, precautions taken moving, as the child moves on, uh, like a measurable, uh, level-based um, growth chart, just like there is for vision and hearing and so on? And, second, and the second question is, please, uh, do you see pharmacists prescribing since they have the most education about prescriptions in the future? Um, so I'll take the second one first. Um, um, no, I mean, we do not see uh, pharmacists prescribing opioids. Uh, pharmacists have a, a critical role, however, and we have worked with the pharmacists, uh, Pharmacy Association and the Pharmacy Board um, so that we, uh, they have a critical role in the prescription drug monitoring program. Uh, they have a role in terms of dispensing and teaching <coughs> about naloxone. Um, and uh, we have worked with them uh, with dispensing guidelines that actually primarily the Pharmacists Association wrote and then uh, went through our task force. And those have been affirmed by the Pharmacy Board. So, and the continuing education counts towards pharmacy credit. So we have involved pharmacists in every step of the way, uh, but I do not see pharmacists prescribing opioids. Uh, we do involve pediatricians. I'm a pediatrician, um, and so pediatricians are part of PA Med and an integral part of our um, uh, of our medical community. Uh, pediatricians um, don't prescribe that many opioids. Um, uh, they they do prescribe some for acute pain. Now I'm not talking about pediatric oncologists who have patients with cancer, but. Regular pediatricians probably are not the highest prescribers of opioids, but they see their patients who might have been prescribed opioids by other physicians for, you know, orthopedic injuries or other types of problems that they have to that they have to monitor. Um, so it's very important for the pediatricians to be involved. Uh, we are uh, want to do prevention for young people uh, through pediatricians as well as through schools. And so the Department of Drug and Alcohol programs and the Department of Education are both involved in terms of. Uh, substance abuse prevention efforts in schools. And I think that expert um, screening, brief intervention, referral, and treatment is a critical aspect for pediatricians, but all physicians and other medical providers so that they know how to screen people for substance abuse disorder, they know how to intervene, they know how to refer, and they know the basics about treatment. So expert is very important. Yes, uh, I'm interested in the issue of the soft Services. I'm an attorney in Philadelphia and I um, handle clients who are involved in drug courts. And one of our challenges, particularly with opiate addicts, is clients with medical assistance who need detox. Um, we are unable to refer them to a detox facility followed by residential treatment. The policy of uh, community behavioral health is that we must refer clients to an assessment center to be assessed for detox. Now there are four or five assessment centers in Philadelphia and they are so overcrowded as I'm sure you know. So when we send clients to those assessment centers, often they're there for days. And they're detoxing actually as they're sitting on a chair waiting to be evaluated. So uh, I wonder if PA Med and if um, Governor the governor's new plan about these special centers are going to affect that. 
Well, I, I think I, I, as a practicing physician, uh, while I'm in cardiology, I, I uh, have, have a small cohort of patients, and then the Pennsylvania Medical Society representing our emergency medicine and other primary care providers. I think I can speak for all of them saying that you know, we share your concern. Uh, it is it is a real concern, and it is it, these are anecdotes. These are these are commonplace. These are more common than the than the simple quick handoffs. Um, the the solution is one that the medical side is committed to working with any stakeholder to try to solve because it is it is probably at this point right up there in the top three of the biggest concerns that um, as a physician I have with my patients in opiates is that I, I don't know. Uh, where to turn when we don't have the resources. I know it's something that's being actively addressed in Harrisburg, and I know that all of our task force are fully committed to working with anyone who can identify the resources to, to help. As far as to come up with the resources, that's something I'll... So, uh, from, the, from the state's point of view, absolutely, it is a significant problem. We do not have enough detox beds, and we do not have enough residential treatment beds. Um, so, so that's that's a significant problem for the state, which which we will be which we're trying to work on. So we actually don't want a soft warm handoff. We want a firm warm handoff. So we we do it's a facilitated referral for treatment, but we want physicians and we want emergency departments and we want other people to be more firm in in recommending that people get treatment and, and not um, and, and not gee you know I, I it sees that you had a problem and you overdose and. You probably should get a, here's a, here's a card to call and you should probably get treatment. Um, if someone again had a heart attack, we wouldn't say, you know, gee, you almost died from that myocardial infarction. You should call a cardiologist, <laughs> have a nice day, and discharge them. So uh, we want people to be referred to treatment. The centers of excellence um, are going to be emphasizing actually outpatient medication assisted treatment. So there, there are certainly, there is role for expansion of all forms of treatment. Uh, in the state and in the, in the, in the system. So that includes um, uh, detox and rehab beds, abstinence-based treatment, 12-step programs, but it also includes for opioid use disorder uh, centers for medication-assisted treatment. There are three medicines that are used in treatment, um, methadone, um, buprenorphine, uh, one brand is called Suboxone, and the other is called uh, uh, Vivitrol or long-acting naltrexone. They all work somewhat differently. Um, and they all can be effective, and none of them are perfect. And there is no magic medicine. It's also important to emphasize that medication-assisted treatment means the medicine assists the treatment. So if you write a prescription and you say, gee, you know, have a, I'll see you later in October, have a really nice month, that's unlikely to be effective. But medication-assisted treatment with counseling and wraparound services <coughs> and total care has been shown nationally to be effective and is certainly being emphasized by, by, by the federal government. So these 45 centers of excellence throughout the state will be emphasizing outpatient treatment and medication-assisted treatment done with quality measures and outcome measures, therapy, wraparound services, etc. So someone who has been diagnosed with opioid use disorder might, after with their assessment, might be able to get, especially with this expansion, right into medication-assisted treatment. Um, so that has been the emphasis in terms, of, in, in terms of Medicaid, but at the same time, we know we need more detox beds, and that's being worked on by Secretary Tennis and DDAP, and we need more, we, we need more um, abstinence-based rehab beds as well. You will find no one uh, more enthusiastic and, and passionate about this than Secretary Tennis of DDAP, and he is working every day, 24-7, to expand treatment options. Um, but it is not an easy lift. Does that answer your question? Yes. Um, this is primarily for Dr. Levine because this is around policy. Obviously, I work in a business that is a crisis opportunity. And we've described um, the laws we've passed and the standing prescription for Narcan, which has saved so many lives, and, that, and that's pretty amazing. But and, and obviously, in the criminal justice system, we're finding that we're making quicker responses. But imagine the family that has a mental health crisis, they're able to call an ACT team, the ACT team can come, and we actually have laws regarding involuntary commitments for people who are essentially helpless around their mental health, and we can actually commit them for periods of time, but at least putting them under the eyes of a physician uh, in response to the, you know, the uh, proliferation of being able to save lives with Narcan, we have immunity staff. So we will certainly encourage family members, loved ones, and fellow, you know, um, addicts, excuse the, the word, but when they're actively using, that's what they call themselves, 
those with substance use disorders actually saving their own uh, fellow substance use disorder person um, by calling police. And, and we have immunity statutes. And then we save that life, as you say, only to lose it again, save it again. And this is the exact opportunity with why in mental health would we have these involuntary commitments for the same types of disorders and not have it with a substance use disorder where we can actually get. Now I recognize it's all about resources. You have to have the resources to be able to commit them to. But we're not doing real well with mental health facilities when we have to commit them for involuntary commitments. But it would seem that it would be hand in hand that if we're going to save these lives and make it immune for people to help save others' lives, to at least have the resources. And again, these are for people outside of the criminal justice system. These are the family members that are here that are suffering losses, and they have nowhere to turn. Their child will go right back to using, because that's the nature of the disorder. So, part. So, um, I, I understand. Mean, how will we, is the, I've understood that they introduced the concept of making involuntary treatment for those with substance use disorders. But I just don't know if you know how far along we are. Um, so I know there has been a bill introduced about that. Uh, and I actually testified at, at one of the hearings uh, for, for that bill. Uh, now, there were some specific aspects of that bill um, that were, were concerning. So my response is that I, I absolutely understand the problem. Is that, is that family members feel uh, that their hands are tied. They see a family member struggling with opioid use disorder. Um, with heroin abuse uh, that might die, and and they 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 offer treatment that we can try to get them treatment, but the patient but the patient refuses, which is which is often part of the disorder. I understand the issue for law enforcement, for first responders who resuscitate people again and again with naloxone. The emergency department physicians feel the same frustration. So um, there are a couple of concerns about the commitment issue. Some are theoretical and some are practical. Um, theoretically, um, many of those in the substance abuse treatment field are concerned about committing somebody who, with the recovery idea model of, of getting better, is that it is a recovery and that you can't commit somebody into recovery. So there have been theoretical concerns expressed by some in the treatment community. The more practical concern which I have expressed, because I have, been, I have worked in emergency departments, and I've worked, I was ensconced in academic medicine before I got this fateful phone call from the, from the governor uh, to join the, the administration, which, which I'm you know, thrilled that I was able to do, is, is a, a matter of resources. So if you commit every patient who is resuscitated with naloxone in the emergency department for 72 hours, where are they going to go? Meaning. The emergency departments, I mean, go, go see your local emergency department on Saturday night, and, you know, there's sometimes I, a patient's in the hallway. Now, it, the, the, if you try to admit them to internal medicine, sometimes there are beds, but sometimes, um, especially in the middle of the winter, um, those beds are all full of internal medicine, and the hospital's on lockdown anyway. If you try to commit them to psychiatry, um, first of all, there aren't enough sometimes adult psychiatry beds anyway, and it's not the best place to treat someone with a substance use disorder. Um, and rehab facilities won't take somebody on commitment because they don't feel that that's the model. So I think that it's important that if you're going to, and maybe it'll come to that, but you're going to have to develop a, a uh, access, and, and really every hospital would need a you know an X10, 12, 15 bed detox unit that's going to handle that overload. So I'm concerned with the legislature saying that uh, we're going to commit all those patients without dealing with the resource issue of what the hospitals are going to do with those patients after they're quote unquote committed. So I think that, that you'll have to, we'll have to deal with, with the resources for the hospitals and not pass the law and then say go implement it to the physicians and the hospitals when there's no resources to do that. So some of it is a very practical consideration. And maybe it'll come to that, but I think that we have to deal with how, what are we going to do after we pass the law before or as we pass it as opposed to trying to figure it out later. Um, the other uh, the part of the law was that if you didn't agree to commitment that you were arrested. Um, I, I have a trouble with that. I think that you know, I'm concerned that people then will not use naloxone because they don't want to be, they don't want to be, they won't call 911 because if they don't go into treatment then they'll be arrested 
you know, you never know when someone's going to when going to be avail uh, mentally available for recovery, and people can be resuscitated several times, and then finally it kind of sinks in. If they think they're going to be arrested, they might just take their chances. So I'm concerned with that that part of the statute. It might very well come to it, but I think we have to deal with the access and the resource issue as we as we discuss that commitment. Does that make sense? It makes sense in a lot. Of hey, Joe. Nice to see you, Judge Romeo. How are you doing? Um, big fan of yours as well. Uh, thank you for the question. So, uh, fun fact, I got, I found recovery in South Florida, and South Florida has a bill similar to the one the judge is speaking about. It's called the Marchman Act. It's an involuntary commitment for substance use disorder. Uh, three family members need to come, petition the judge. If the judge accepts the petition, uh, within 72 hours, a warrant is uh, issued and the person is taken to um, a psych assessment center. And I watched that bill save, or that law save all kinds of people's lives. Doctors, lawyers, um, students. And I was a fan of that. Uh, my struggle with laws like that, and I'm not sure what the right answer is, is, is the self-determination issue. Um, but at the same time, uh, one of the research studies I love to quote is, you know, people say all the time, you know, people can't get better unless they want to. And I said, that's not true. Is that what the research says? Which is not true. Because people, uh, there's a study done on people that went into uh, treatment for their substance use disorder inside of prisons, which is involuntary treatment, trust me. Um, and they did not recover at any higher rates than people who self-selected into those programs. So I'm not sure what the answer is, but I think the answer has to come from people like us and not necessarily people in Harrisburg. Uh, and I know they you know, engage stakeholders and stuff, but uh, I don't know if you've ever been up there, but I worry about their ability to legislate on this all the time. Um, I do, I do. Pennsylvania was the 50th state to legalize right on red. And I want to make one more comment. I hope I'm not, I'm not this. I had a thought about the centers of excellence. So what I heard you say, Dr. Levine, is that um, People on Medicare will have expanded access to medically assisted treatment through these centers. Medicaid. Right, Medicaid, yes. sorry. Yes. Um, and those will be medically assisted treatment programs, which I love. I'm a big fan of MAT. I am not the recovery police. Whatever works for you is great. What I'm hearing is that we're only giving people with less resources one options. Um, and I feel some kind of way about that. And I get it. We got to, you know, it's better to have somebody. Um, on, a medi on medication and with a therapist than stealing their mama's TV. I, I agree. But something about that, like, I don't know. You know what I mean? You don't have to take the right. medicine no, to no, be no. in the treatment. Okay, so, but, yeah. so they are expanding 45 centers of excellence, but the, the emphasis, right. with the, the pivot, right. will be towards medication-assisted right. treatment. But you don't have okay. to, to go into MAT to enter one of those programs. Okay, right. it's not, they're not new programs. We're expanding current, current programs. Program programs. People apply for grants, right. and they're going to get, I believe it's five hundred thousand dollars. Don't quote me. Um, for uh, of extra grant money to expand um, uh, access, right. and uh, the emphasis will be MAT. But it's going to be MAT with, with quality and outcome measurements. It can't, it's not going to be cash prescriptions, which right. is one of the concerns. But sometimes how MAT is prescribed. I'm going to uh, steal my for a second too, and I want to expand upon something you just said. Um, one of the things I, I speak about this issue. Uh, you know, less formal than the PowerPoint, but in more of this arena on a regular basis with our elected officials and with community stakeholders. And there's a couple things that when you leave this room, um, for those that are, that uh, are uh, have lived this either personally or with family members, uh, you may know some of this. And for those who haven't, I think it's important just to take a little bit of a step back for when you leave the room, what you take with you. The reason why we are in this situation right now is because the pendulum swung way too far. I don't think it could have swung any farther in the wrong direction in the way that we treat pain. But one of the things that we also be careful for, about, and I only gonna make, I, didn't, I purposely didn't make it in my talk because it's not what today's necessarily about, is when you leave here, we can't demonize people who have pain. And we can't demonize people who use and take narcotics appropriately. Uh, because there is still a role for them, I, I, and I think that's important because I don't want anyone going home and going into uh, someone's medicine cabinet and throwing them away because for the right person at the right time and the right dose, 
there is a real role for narcotics, but in a much different way than what we used them before. That's point number one. And point number two um, is uh, we, we are fortunate that we do have elected officials on both sides of the aisle. Um, I mean, the governor's office really has made this a, a real priority, but on both sides of the aisles that are really um, all very well intended. I haven't, while I haven't agreed when I'm sitting in public hearings uh, with uh, at times some of the points that are made, I know the people making the points who make the laws are all well intended. Um, the one thing that we do have to be careful about is that we all work together because there are nuances that someone who has been through recovery can educate us on, that even the physicians who treat patients all the time don't know. And there are issues that we as physicians come across every single day that are completely logical, make sense to us at second nature, where a law might step on appropriate care and really, really deprive someone of appropriate care. So I think that the points that are being made really, when you go out and if you, if you hear conversations in the community or if you're working actively on this, no one stakeholder um, can, can make a law or make a policy or put a program in place without working with all the rest. Yeah, I have one from the, the next room, actually, for Dr. Shapiro, based on, uh, well, to follow up almost to what you just said. Um, this question is three parts. Uh, don't you think... <laughs> Should be a quick answer. I think it'll be a quick answer, though. It says, don't you think that narcotics should be the last resort for pain? Shouldn't we be treating opioid uh, prescriptions like we now treat antibiotics, not unless it's absolutely necessary? And should we try to take the edge off for outpatients after minor procedures with Tylenol or Advil instead of writing prescriptions for Percocet like it's candy? Yeah, like it's candy. Great. <laughs> Uh, great, great questions, and, and ones that we uh, we've tackled through our "Be Smart, Be Safe, Be Sure" campaign. Uh, yes, uh, if somebody comes in, uh, and uh, I, I've had this happen on many occasions because they stub their big toe and they want uh, 300 Percocet pills. You're, you're absolutely correct, but that's just that's not going to uh, that that's not going to fly. And it might have in the past, um, not necessarily with the vast majority of physicians, but maybe with some. Uh, clearly, what we have what we have emphasized is that um, it has to be the right medication for the right pain at the right time. Uh, for my patients, uh, it's rare that I write a narcotic, and I have patients who go for open heart surgery. They have bypass, they have sternotomies, they're opening their chest. And when I do, we, we write them in, in small numbers. But we oftentimes have found that non-steroidals, medications like Advil, um, or slightly higher doses than what you have in your cabinet or a leave, can oftentimes be equally effective for the patients with the right level of pain and are usually, for most physicians now that are treating the run of the mill type pain, where we start. There's a lot of options out there and that's what the continuing med medical education is trying to get at, where we have had deficiencies because of the way physicians have been directed to treat pain over the previous few decades, where we've now had deficiencies in our education, we're working with the medical society to pick that up. I will also caution though, uh, and I saw a patient yesterday uh, who's 35 years old, and uh, the woman has metastatic breast cancer. It's all over her body. It's in her bone. Um, she is um, in excruciating pain. We will not cure her. She, she will not live to 40. Um, and she is not somebody that, you, that uh, when you have tried the other medications quickly, that you don't. That she is not something you should delay on pulling the trigger on giving them the narcotic. That's an appropriate patient for the narcotic. We know who they are early when they're appropriate in those scenarios. And we just got to be careful. Um, there's, there, we're going to get the medical education to where it needs to be all across the country. We're not there yet. Um, but I think once we get there, everyone will be comfortable with the right patients. We'll be getting the right meds at the right time. So I, I just wanted to make a comment. I, I agree with that. I think that it's important to realize that for many patients who've been prescribed chronic opioids, mm -hmm. not the type of patients that have cancer, but some of this chronic musculoskeletal pain or other chronic pains, actually chronic opioids is being shown to, to not really help their pain. <laughs> that it's not, it's not a particularly good use uh, of the opioids for, for their pain. Now, I'm not talking about the patient you just mentioned. Um, but we do need to, to work on coverage for alternatives for chronic pain that don't involve opioids because there are, 
Um, there are other modalities, and I think and that's actually going to be your fifth, the fifth module, is mm -hmm. how to treat chronic pain without opioids. And we are going to write up uh, a, a prescribing guideline to match the module. Um, but that might, include, uh, that might include physical therapy, occupational therapy, that might include biofeedback, cognitive behavioral therapy, acupuncture, um, other things. But some, a lot of times it's not covered by insurance, and that makes it really challenging to say, well, we recommend acupuncture, except they don't have the means and the insurance doesn't cover it. So that's something we're going to have to work through. So we have about a half a minute, and I think rather than, uh, do we have time for well, one more question? In the, uh, in the blue shirt over there has been okay. very patiently waiting Great. since exactly. the first time. No, I work with the public defender, so we have a lot of clients that go to the Suboxone clinics, the methadone clinics, and there's really no component that they're required to do treatment with that, and they don't have a plan to do it at all. So a lot of our clients are on it indefinitely for years and years and years, and it's concerning. So two things uh, for the for the for Medicaid and for the Centers of Excellence, um, they will be required to have those other modalities. So as part of the Centers of Excellence, um, you will, they will have to have uh, and, the, and to qualify for this extra funding and this grant funding, um, they will be required to have counseling and therapy. It might be group, it might be individual. There's a lot of different ways to do that, but but they, it won't just be um, medicine only. They'll have to have the other counseling. You know, it is very debatable in the field, however, about coming off the medicines. There are people who take methadone and take Suboxone, and after a number of times, several, several years, can be weaned off. But there are some patients with the disease of addiction, that, with the disease of substance abuse disorder, that actually, will, if they come off, they're going to relapse. And so, now, it's not so easy sometimes to tell which, which, how, which patient is which. And so substance abuse treatment experts, and addictions medicine specialists, do, do work on that, about how, how can you tell who should you wean off and who you shouldn't. But if you wean somebody off uh, and they relapse, uh, that, that's, that's obviously very bad and they're more at risk of overdosing. So there are some patients that will be on that medicine. You know, there are patients um, who are on diabetes medicine and high blood pressure medicine and high cholesterol medicine, and they're going to take that the rest of their life. That's not great, but that's, that's, uh, that's the way it is. So there are patients who will be on methadone and suboxone. If they are doing really well, if they are, if they are functional, if they are in their, in their home and in their community and in their life, um, that's okay. I mean, it, it might not be perfect. You'd love for them not to have to take it, but they need that medicine. The question is which, which patients can come off and which can't, and so experts are trying to do research to determine that. But some patients, it's clear, actually will be on it the rest of their life, and, and that's better than being on heroin. Okay. Please join me in uh, thanking.